Hello, I'm Donald McIntyre, NewFination.com. This is NewFination Live, and joining us is David Schwartz, Chief Cryptographer of the Ripple Labs of Ripple Labs. Hello, David. How are you? Hey, Donald. I'm doing well. How are you? Very well, thank you, David. I wanted to ask you, as a cryptographer and also the the cryptographer at Ripple Labs, uh, about uh, what happened in the Bitcoin network. Uh, malleability, which was a serious problem in the last 10 days. Uh, but before that, can you tell me about your background? Um, sure. Um, recently, I was hired about three years ago by Jed McCaleb to see if there was another solution to the double spend problem using a distributed agreement protocol rather than proof of work. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, um, I was involved in secure cloud storage and secured messaging for um, government and military customers mostly. Did you work? Did you work on the Bitcoin protocol also? I did a little bit. In fact, that's how Jed found me. Um, I was just I was just kind of finishing up the work that I was doing, and I was looking for something to do next. And I stumbled on Bitcoin, and people were having some problems with mining pools. The, uh -huh. the mining explosion was just starting to happen, and the software really was never designed to be efficient when you had all these different miners hitting it from all different directions. So people started offering these large rewards in Bitcoins for someone who would solve that problem. I'm like, what are these Bitcoins, and are they worth money? And I realized <laughs> that, that it was actually something quite revolutionary that I had stumbled on completely accidentally and so I made some changes to Bitcoin to make mining more efficient and then Jed found me through that. Uh, and you earned the bounty? <laughs> <laughs> yes I did actually. I, earned, I think I earned something like 40 Bitcoins. I wish I would held them a little longer than I did. <laughs> um, David, well, you, you, you just said something uh, very uh, important that um, you you were like re recruited to to find another solution for the double spending problem, and I knew from before that double spending was the 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 thing that the Bitcoin solved finally. But exactly. you say that it's it's through it's through. I'm not technical, so you you say it it's through uh, proof of work, and and Ripple is different is through consensus. Exactly. Um, but. Also, in the last few days, I learned something that uh, I would say another problem that the protocol has, the Bitcoin protocol has, and that is uh, malleability. How, how is malleability different to double spending? Um, so double spending is a fundamental problem that any financial system is going to have. It doesn't have a central authority. When I write mm -hmm. you a check, I can't, send, I can't spend the same $500 both to pay you and, let's say, to pay my landlord. The bank won't, won't clear the check. So you have a central authority that says, yes, this person has the money, or no, they don't. If you're trying to design a system like Bitcoin or Ripple that doesn't have a central authority, there has to be some way to prevent a person from sending the same funds to two different places. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the system doesn't work. Yeah. And without a central authority, there was no good solution known to that problem until Bitcoin came along. Bitcoin solved that problem with proof of work. Ripple solves it with consensus. Transaction malleability is a different issue. Um, it, it's, it goes basically like this. Both Bitcoin, Ripple, and all the altcoins um, secure transactions because if it's your money, you have to sign a transaction in order mm -hmm. to spend that money. And those signatures are designed using a mathematical algorithm that requires a secret that only you know. So I can't mm -hmm. spend your money because I can't make that signature. Only you can the problem with transaction malleability is that you can't sign the signature. You don't have the signature until you've signed it. Once you have the signature, you're already done signing. So the transaction has the portion that's signed that says how much you're spending and who it's going to, and that's all completely secure. But then there's this signature, and that signature yeah. itself is not signed. So if okay. someone can change that signature in such a way that it still is a valid signature, but is not literally identical to the original signature. Now those two s transactions, one with the signature you made and one with the m mutated signature, a mutant signature, are both mm -hmm. valid. Only one of them can process. Both Bitcoin and Ripple have a security mechanism to ensure that you can't process both transactions. The problem is, if you see the mutant confirm, you might think that your original transaction never confirmed. So it fools the person who forms the transaction or the recipient. If you tell me you have 10 Bitcoins coming, here's the transaction ID. Mm -hmm. I will show that transaction ID never going through because a mutant with a different transaction ID has gone through. And that's what causes the problem. So it doesn't cause a double spend problem. It doesn't allow people to steal your money. But what it does allow is automated systems that issue high volume transactions can become confused if they're not very carefully designed. 
that's what I what I under, understood the last few days. So it's not that the blockchain, the register or the ledger in the blockchain is is modified. It's like it creates confusion on the on the client side, on the operators. Right, and unfortunately, because of one design thing in Bitcoin, um, it's especially vulnerable, and that is this. If, if I send you 10 Bitcoins and you want to spend two of them, you have to refer to the transaction in which I sent you those Bitcoins. It's not like, you sort of, it's not like an account is real in Bitcoin. It's the actual output. So if I send you 10 Bitcoins, that's an output that you can claim to spend, send Bitcoins to someone else. The problem is when you refer to those Bitcoins I sent you, you have to refer to them by transaction ID. Mm -hmm. So if the transaction ID is not what you expect, your transaction becomes invalid. So if you have a long chain of transactions that spend each other's outputs and someone changes the transaction ID on one of them, the chain jams and all the ones after it are invalid and someone manually has to unjam that chain. But where, where does the jam happen? For example, in the, in, in the case of empty Gox, no? And empty Gox, they are, they are matching people who are buying and selling all the time. Right. Uh, and, then, and then they have people sending to their accounts and withdrawing out of empty gox. Where, where does the jam happen? So you would think that you could safely spend the outputs of your own transactions because you know your own transactions are good as long as you follow some basic rules. So you yes. might submit transaction one and then later, like, a, like five seconds later, transaction two that spends the output of transaction one. But you have to spend the output of transaction one by transaction ID. So if somebody changes the signature and changes the transaction ID, then transaction two won't go through. And so, and then if you form transaction three and four and five based on those earlier transactions, that whole chain will jam. And that's what started to happen to people. But it, it, it didn't jam on the blockchain itself. No, it jammed in the pending transaction pool. So when you, if you're a miner, you oh, get okay. to decide what transactions to include. So you have a group okay. of transactions waiting to go in. And so what happens is those transactions get stuck in that pool, but they'll never go in because they'll never become valid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when, when, you, when I originate a transaction from my phone or my computer to send you, say, one Bitcoin, I, I, I send a transmission to the whole network saying I'm sending to David one Bitcoin. Exactly. That that enters for the, the the network takes it, but it's it's awaiting confirmation. Exactly. And and, and in that in that stage is where where the jam uh, happens. Right. Exactly. So the circuit when you form that transaction, you assume that the network is going to look like you expect it to look. And if somebody mutates one of your earlier transactions, then the network doesn't look like you expected it to look, and your transaction is now referring to the wrong transaction ID. So your and, transaction and is jammed. Who, who, who could take, who could generate a problem with this? Uh, if, if you and I were both honest, it doesn't happen. There's no double, uh, second transaction. Well, the problem is a miner can do it. Any miner who wants to can do it. And even non-miners can do it. So th the easiest case is imagine if you're a miner and you have, let's say, 50 unconfirmed transactions that you're going to include in the block. You could just mm -hmm. add a zero byte to the end of every single signature. Mm -hmm. And now the transaction ID You duplicate everything. Exactly. The miner gets to choose which transactions go in the block they mine, so they can mutate every single transaction if they wanted to. Okay. So there's two there's there's a replica of those transactions and, and, and the whole system jams. It jams if you form a transaction using the output based on transaction ID. So one simple workaround is never do that. The problem mm -hmm. is if you're someone like Gox where well, you're producing high volumes of transactions, that constraint that you can't spend the output of any previous transaction until it's 100% guaranteed that you know it's transaction ID, mm -hmm. that's a pretty difficult limit. What that means is you have to have more coins in circulation because you have to wait longer to turn them around. And that, from a security standpoint, you want to have as many coins as you can in cold storage where nobody can touch them. You don't want to have more coins in circulation because that increases your risk. What happened at the Bitstamp, for example, and empty Gox was because of this problem of malleability, they, 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 had, they were sending Bitcoins to people who wanted to withdraw but they lost track of what they sent, so they, they, they didn't want to send twice the same money. Exactly. 
normally the night the thing that you would do if like you didn't know about transaction malleability the way you would determine whether you had paid someone or not is you would track the transaction ID if I pay you one Bitcoin because you withdraw from my exchange I track the transaction ID when that transaction confirms I know you got the one Bitcoin yeah. now if it's tomorrow and that transaction didn't confirm I might think you didn't get that one Bitcoin I wouldn't so necessarily Right, right. I wouldn't necessarily think that you might have received that one Bitcoin with a different transaction ID. Yeah. Now, that attack yeah. was actually known since 2011. That's kind of the older version. But this idea that, that high-volume transaction streams can be jammed, that's the new version of the same problem. It just didn't occur to anyone that those two properties of Bitcoin, transaction malleability and the fact that you have to refer to an output by transaction ID, would interact in this bad way. And that's what happened recently. Is is this new problem? Um, is it is it uh, possible to solve it? Like have a, a new version in a few weeks and uh, of the protocol and, and solve it? There's a couple of different solutions. If everybody could change everything all at once, you could solve it very, very simply. You could define a new standard where one and only one signature was valid for a transaction, where there was one and only one way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of complicated because you have to get everybody to sort of reject transactions that otherwise seem valid. Or you have to start mutating everybody's transactions if they don't meet the new rules. It's not a very pleasant thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So I believe what Bitcoin is going to do, it looks like, is they're going to come up with a new form of transaction ID that's just used for tracking the transaction to see whether it uh, went through or not. And that won't include the signature in the ID. So if someone mutates the signature, they'll change the transaction ID, but they won't change this new ID. Okay. Very good. Can, can you tell me how Ripple is different and how Ripple works and how, yeah, how Ripple is different to the Bitcoin protocol? Uh, you said uh, instead of using proof of work, you, you use consensus. Yes. How, how is it different and why it doesn't have this problem? Well, there's, yeah, there's two basic differences between Ripple and Bitcoin. One of them is that we use consensus instead of proof of work. The other is that we have built in from the beginning uh, the ability to transact in arbitrary assets like dollars or yuan or mm -hmm. whatever. But as far as transaction malleability goes, basically we have similar issues because we also have transaction IDs and you can also mutate uh, Ripple signatures. So we're going to have to implement the, our own solution so that people can track transactions by transaction ID to prevent against that uh, problem where you think that you made a payment. Um, well, you haven't made a payment. Well, you've made a payment, but you think that you haven't made that payment. Uh, but where we're not vulnerable is you don't refer to previous outputs by transaction ID. You refer to previous outputs by account. So there's okay. not. It's not like somebody can cause your transactions to jam. Very good. So so it has a, a, the same problem, and you're going to fix it, but it's a little bit different. It's not as severe because they can't jam your transaction chains. Yeah. Let, let, it's also let, let, harder let, to exploit because there's no miners. Let, let me, let me, uh, the way I understand Bitcoin, also from a non-technical perspective, is that if I send one Bitcoin to you, uh, the ledger says, okay, from Donald's address uh, is minus one to, to David's address is plus one, and that the transaction is, is uh, done there. Uh, but nevertheless, even though everybody can see that in the ledger, it's pending a confirmation that is every 10 minutes. The confirmation is done by the mining pool that they need to prove that they did some work. And right. once they prove it, they enter the block into the, they confirm everything that happened. That's correct. Uh, how, how is, uh, so that, that's, that's why you need miners. In, in Ripple, I understand there's no miners and that correct. every transaction is, is instantly, in a few seconds, is approved. How does that right. work? Um, I like to model it as a room full of people who just constantly agree with each other. Mm -hmm. So if you want to perform a transaction in Ripple, you basically walk into this metaphorical room and read out the transaction. If the transaction is valid and there's no reason it shouldn't be agreed on, essentially everybody in the room nods, yep, that looks good to me. They compute a new ledger in which that transaction has taken place and they all agree on the hash of that new ledger. As soon as you have a supermajority who's agreed to the new ledger hash, then you know that that transaction is confirmed. And any conflicting transaction, like sending those same funds to someone else, can't occur because those funds have already been sent to you in the ledger that everybody agreed on. That's a, an oversimplification, but that's the basic idea. So, so it's more or less like the like the Chicago mark used to be before I was a stockbroker. So, 
Uh, so everybody would go there and scream, I sell 100 contracts, and another guy would scream, I buy them, and everybody knows, and that's how I, how the transaction Ex is. And there's almost like a big board that everybody's looking at, exactly. That's essentially uh, how it works. If the same guy wants to double spend, and that is to sell again 100 that he doesn't have, uh, everybody would say no because you already sold it. Right, and worse, if they do say yes, they have a problem because they have to cryptographically sign everything they say. Mm -hmm. So if I have a cryptographic signature of you approving two transactions that conflict, I have proof that you're malicious. And all okay. I have to do is present that to people, and they're just not going to listen to you anymore. So, so on Ripple, it, I, when, I, when I send you one, one XRP, in a few seconds there's consensus, and it's definitive. Right, and then you have a super majority of the nodes that are operating who have signed a sort of receipt saying, I've signed this ledger, and then you know that the transactions occurred in that ledger. So exactly. double spending double spending is resolved, but what you say that is spending is to solve the malleability. Yeah, so you could still have the malleability problem in Ripple if you track transactions by ID and you said, oh, this transaction didn't go through, I better send another one. Mm -hmm. We don't think anybody does that right now, but if they did, then they could potentially be tricked. So we're going to close that hole completely using a solution similar to what Bitcoin uses. We'll be announcing that in a couple of days. In a couple of days? Very yeah. good. Well, now when, when, does ha when that happens on, on Ripple and Bitcoin, I think the markets are going to be much, much more calm. <laughs> yeah, the market reacted rather stunningly to this problem. I think people were worried that it was a fundamental problem that couldn't be resolved. But it's a fairly narrow technical problem, and we know how to fix it. We just have to actually do it. This uh, today, today it was strange. I, I didn't see any any news, and and on empty gox, the price is two thirty something like that. Do 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 you have any any news? No, I don't. I I would just point out to people that that's not a meaningful price. I mean, for a price to be meaningful, bitcoins have to be roughly equivalent to a bitcoin in your bitcoin wallet, and the dollars have to be roughly equivalent to a dollar in your pocket. A bitcoin mm -hmm. on Gox that you can't withdraw is nothing like a bitcoin in your bitcoin wallet, and a dollar at Mt. Gox that you can't withdraw is not much like a dollar in your wallet. So it's like, mm -hmm. what's the rate, what's the value of a Bitcoin you can't withdraw in terms of dollars you can't withdraw? It doesn't reflect the value of actual Bitcoins. It reflects the problems that Gox is having. Yes, I, I agree. Be before, at the premium, it was trading at 1,000 when everywhere else it was trading at 850. It was also uh, distorted. <laughs> yes, I agree. Very good. Bueno, thank you very much, David. A pleasure, Dan. Bye-bye.